Okay. Right. So, um, what is the point of this talk, I guess, is the initial thing. So, this is a talk I initially wrote um, for the um, Cray User Group conference back in May this year. And actually, quite a lot of people have expressed interest in um, what we're talking about, in measuring the usage of and looking at the profile of the usage of different parallel software, software applications on um, different facilities. So what we've been doing, you can see, see since um, the Hector days, is trying to record the applications that people are using on the system, what scale they're using them at, and trying to link them to different um, science areas, or different code types, and then this analysis, this uh, talk is the beginning of the analysis of that sort of data. Okay, there's a lot of data there, and this isn't by any means the end of the analysis. So let me go back and go to the next slide. Oh, so there's a creative comments notice. Fine, you can reuse this material if you want. I should also say um, before we start that some of the images, I don't know how well the images will come across on the sort of webinar software. So the slides are already available on the Archer website. If you go to the um, where you follow the link to log in to this talk, you can get a copy of the slides and you can follow through there. It might be easier to see some of the numbers and some of the pictures um, on a local copy of the slides than over the um, webinar software. And um, there's the standard uh, logo zoo that we have to put up that, say, that acknowledges all the people who funded Archer and all the people who are working on it. So the, what I'm going to talk about in this talk is the motivation why we're uh, doing this analysis in particular, and what systems were included in, in this work, um, a very short section on the analysis tool, how we connected the data, um, some overall comparisons, it's very really broad look at the, what the data reveals, some look at specific research areas, and a quick future look and summary of what um, we've been talking about. So, and I also like to put my acknowledgements at the start, otherwise, I always forget to do them at the end. So, thanks to uh, particularly Alan Simpson, Stephen Booth here at EPCC and the USL team, who've uh, had, have had a lot of chat about this data and what it means and the meaning of it. And also to the Cray Sense Rex and staff here at the University of Adam particularly a guy called Jason Beach Brands who's since left Cray. But um, he was instrumental in analyzing and understanding the analysis here. Yeah. So why are we doing it? So this is essentially quite the user support needs on groups. So the main reason we're doing it is to understand Hopefully, we understand the application profile on the UK National Supervision Services and provide a better service. Right? Different research areas have different requirements. Looking at understanding how different codes scale and what their needs are um, can be really helpful for us in improving the service and tailoring the service uh, to better meet the needs of the users. Uh, we want to know which areas are growing in usage and which are decreasing. So, which areas should we be looking at to support? in the future, or should we be thinking about investing expertise in um, to understand where they're going, and which areas are decreasing use, and maybe understand why that is, have their requirements changed, Do, does the national service not meet their requirements anymore, and ask them why. And the same questions for applications as well as research areas, which new applications have appeared, which others want to disappear, and why. Okay. Um, and we want to know particularly understand scaling as well. So there's a lot of talk about moving to exascale, about the next generation of systems coming up. Can we say anything about what's limiting scaling um, for particular applications or research areas? And does that help us in uh, preparing for future systems? So one thing I sh should say is this, this is essentially a start of the analysis of the data. Okay, so a lot of the stuff here is quite a broad overview um, of different research areas. So Although I may make some points that are, I hope are broadly true and represented by the data, there may be individual exceptions if you delved into the um, data. So anything I say about particular areas here, I think shouldn't be taken verbatim as representative of every user and every code in that research area. But this is looking at the statistics in a, sort of a very broad sense and trying to get some um, very uh, sort of coarse messages about what's 
uh, going on here. And the systems we've included in our analysis are um, Hector and Archer. So we have here um, a picture at the top left of Hector Phase 2A, which was the uh, quad core um, AMD system. Uh, in the bottom left, you've got Hector Phase 3, which was the final incarnation of Hector Phase 2 cores per node. And on the right is a picture of Archer uh, with um, 24 cores per node, which is but with Intel highly greater on than the AMD processors. Actually, in a bit more detail, I have a table here um, giving a little detail about the systems included. So we have Phase 2A, which was Cray XD4. As I said, they had four cores per node and one um, processor socket. It had a uh, particular uh, certain amount of memory per core, uh, just over three, sorry, a certain amount of memory per node and a certain amount of bandwidth per core, certain amount of nodes and um, peak system. Actually, I'm not really interested in the details of the systems here in particular, but actually what you should notice, I think, is that the big change is going from um, phase 2A hectare to phase 2B, where we jump from four cores in the node to 24 cores in the node. There was an order magnitude, almost an order magnitude change in the number of cores per node. Since then, although the performance has kept doubling, the uh, peak performance anyway, the number of cores per node has stayed um, pretty much the same. Most of that um, improvement in performance has come from um, a combination of um, increased vector widths and floating point you know, performance. So one of the big stories that people tend to talk about at the moment is there's no um, speed up on a core for core basis. Right? I mean, that's one of the central tenets is that you don't really get, when you increase, um, when you buy some new processors, the new cores are not really supposed to be a huge amount more powerful than the uh, cores you originally had. And that's not actually been our experience in particular going from Hector, Hector to Archer. We saw a big uplift in performance per core for most codes on moving from Hector Phase 3, the AMD processors, to the Intel processors. And most of this we found was due to um, the improvements in the memory subsystem available on the Intel processors. So most, a lot of codes are memory bound, and they saw a huge jump in performance in going from the AMD to the Intel processors. And so there's better memory and a better memory sub subsystem. And this brings into the sort of highlights one problem in doing this sort of analysis that I'm talking about today is that cores aren't really directly comparable across systems, right? It's really difficult to say that a Hector phase 3 core is the same as a Hector, as, as an Archer core. It's because, as I mentioned, the Archer cores, if you look at it naively for the code, maybe due to the memory, but they give you get about two to three times the performance out of an Archer core as you would have got on a Hector one which means you can run smaller jobs for the same overall performance. This is obviously going to skew the scaling statistics. So what I did do when I was trying to do this analysis, well, the one thing I played around with was um, the scaling, the plots I'm going to show you with relative performance of the cores over um, a suite of benchmarks. But actually, all it did was really complicate the picture and make it very difficult to understand what was going on. So I stuck with raw core counts for the plots you're going to see later in the um, presentation, uh, but we, we just need to bear in mind, I think, that not all cores are made equal. Um, so the size comparisons of jobs, although interesting, may have been affected by this uh, performance increase, particularly on going from Hector, um, to, Hector to Archer going forwards. Um, just a few slides on the analysis tool. So what we have is um, a small script that polls what's called ALPS, which is the Cray application placement um, system on an hourly basis. This stores uh, the username, size of the job, the executable name, and something called the ALPS ID, which is a job identifier. Actually monitoring which applications people are using at one time um, can be quite challenging uh, for systems because for a number of reasons. Is how do you do this? Generally, uh, particularly on the national services we run, you do not get any information about the executable that's running from the job log. So we run PBS. PBS contain, the PBS job logs that come back contain no information about the executable that the user actually ran. You could try logging 
uh, module loads and unloads and things like that. So on Archer, you've got a lot of our software, central software is provided through modules. So you can, for example, log every time that somebody loaded the BAS module or the CASTEP module and try and catch data that way. But that's not going to catch people who compile their own codes in their own user space. You don't load a module um, to actually get access to the code. What ALPS actually contains is the executable name run. And it doesn't contain the full path to the executable, so we're not pulling anything to do with central located executables. All we have is the executable name. So we can analyze these logs um, using a small Python program that includes, includes a set of regu regular expressions that are known to match against known applications. Okay, so we can assign a variety of executable names to different applications. And these descriptions are extensible, so the tool produces reports of um, executable names it didn't understand as well as ones it did um, to try and help us um, spit. And then we can go and speak to users about those ones and add new um, tools, so new codes to the tool and things like that. We can limit by a specific period or project, which are obvious things. We get text graphical CVS, sorry, CSV output. And as I said, it gives you hints to try and identify further applications. So, for example, the sort of text output you get is this sort of thing, and um, this is tabled by CPU hours for um, different codes. We're including percentage of time used, as, uh, sorry, percentage of the total time accumulated uh, in this analysis. Number of jobs, percentage of jobs, number of unique users using the code, uh, the mean job size, and also the median job size. Okay. And we also get some sort of graphical output. And using, because it's using Python, we use that properly. And so this shows the usage over time for um, different codes and things like that. The actual analysis tool isn't particularly interesting. Just the only interesting thing about it is that calculating what applications be, or monitoring what applications people are using is actually quite a tricky problem. And there's very, you have to think carefully depending on how your system runs how you're going to do such a thing. Okay, so let's get to a of some actual data. Um, that we got from the system. So the first more obvious thing you might want to do is say, what were the top codes used by um, CPU hours, node hours? Actually, the smallest units are Hector and Archer's both node hours because the smallest unit allocation is a single node. So what are the codes, top 10 codes, ordered by node hours on the uh, four systems we looked at? Remember, the big jump was going from Hector phase to A, which was the quad core to Hector phase to B with 24 cores per node. And in each of these cases, I haven't put the numbers up here, but the top five codes account for around 40% 40 of the total time used on the system. So first thing to notice is there's not a huge amount of change between the systems. And um, so Inc is asking, can you monitor how many calls are occupied busy? So the answer to that is yes, Alps gives us that information. At the moment, we don't log it, so we're not actually um, logging the detail of how many calls per node people are using, people are actually using. Yeah, but that um, information is available and helps. And I guess one of the extensions I'd like to do in the future is make sure the tool is logging that information on a per job basis as well. So how to factor in your monitor which is running? I'm not sure. What do you mean by the question? Can you elaborate a bit? So, the mo okay, the tool itself does not take a call. Okay, is the first thing. So, Alps knows about all the jobs that are running on the compute nodes. When I query Alps, I'm running on a login node. Okay, so it doesn't actually take up any space on the compute nodes at all. All it does is ask the scheduling system what's running on the compute nodes. Okay, so the, the monitoring tool itself does not take up any resources on the compute nodes, so it doesn't interfere with running jobs in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so in Yes, so memory recall peak would also be useful. Um, at the moment, I don't know if Alps gives that or not. I have to check. One of the things we've been interested in 
is trying to is how we would monitor actual application memory usage on Archer. Uh, we've talked to Cray about this a few times, and we've never quite got to the stage where we can incorporate it into the data we've been gathering either through this monitoring tool or through the safe, the standard safe job logs. Uh, but that is something we're actively looking at, trying to get working because it is really useful information uh, for future procurements in particular. Um, so, what else to say about the uh, top 10 codes? Okay, so there's a, the new codes that have cons appeared consistently across um, the time of the monitoring from Hectophase 2A to Archer are probably CP2K and Glomax have both emerged as major, play major players. On Hectophase 2A, it was the fifth largest used use, use code and it's moved into the top two and consistently stayed there um, for Archer and the end of Hector. And Glomax wasn't even placed at the early days of Hector. Um, but as time has gone on, Glomax has become a more and more important code on the national services. Um, codes that have decreased in use, well, the only one that seems to have moved down in a significant way is CASTA um, at the moment. But actually, although the relative percentage usage has decreased, there's probably still more CPU hours used per month on CASTA on Archer than there was on Hector in any of the phases. So the capacity, the increased capacity of Archer means that you probably, users are probably still using more time in general each month on Castec, even though its position, I guess, in the top 10 has moved. Okay, so um, another overall comparison you can do is by using these code, so EL Poly use also dropped. Yes, DL Poly is much more variable, I think, is what I'd say. So DL Poly sort of shows up in Hector Phase 2A at number 10, but it's not, it's not there in Phase 2B. It appears high up in Phase 3 and then goes away again in Archer. And actually, I'll talk a bit more about DL Poly in particular later in the talk, because it shows some um, interesting features. So the other overall comparison you can do is by roughly based on the application, and trying to split it into um, the, science, the sort of science area it's used, it's used um, on the system. And here's the bar chart. The blue bars are Hector Phase 2A, red Phase 2B, green Phase 3, and purple Archer. You can still see that the most use of the system is generally for um, material science, and that's been consistent. That's consistent across all of um, the national services provided by EPSRC and NERC followed by the climate ocean modeling block, and then the other, the other things. The one the part that's growing is um, biomolecular simulation. And in the others section, the lot, by far the largest growth we see um, from Hector phase 2A to Archer is in uh, medical science applications. Although they don't really show up in this graph because they don't, still don't use a huge amount of time, they've gone from 0.01% of the total time used on Hector Phase 2A up to about half a percent on Archer. So things such as lattice bolts and simulations of blood flow, blood flow um, have appeared and uh, those sorts of applications. Uh, Biomolecular uh, simulation and CFD have both grown as time gone on as well. One thing I should mention about this graph is if people aren't used to looking at um, the national service that EPSLC in there, um, producing the science areas on it. Both QCD and astrophysics are missing from here because they belong to a different research council. So their, their, usage, yes, their usage is on, usually on um, different HPC systems. There's a different national HPC system. Yes, so all the data um, is available. And actually, I will show you at the end of this talk, it's freely downloadable from the Archer website, all the data I use to produce these graphs and things like that in terms of raw uh, CPU hours. Sorry, Aaron, Aaron was asking if he was actual, able to get the actual core hours data used. So if I move on to the next slide. So 
I just want to stop here because there's going to be, I'll explain a bit more here, there's going to be a lot of these types of plots, or quite a few of these types of plots throughout the rest of the talk. So, and they're at least reasonably confusing because they look like they're supposed to be um, line charts, but they're not. They're sort of like histograms. So what we've got here is each of these um, areas here on the x-axis is essentially a bin of core counts. So 0 to 96 here, 97 to 384 and so on and so forth and this is this one scale is percentage of core hours so for example for hectare phase 2a which is the blue curve just over 20 percent of the total core hours are used in jobs that are 0 to 96 cores the reason i plotted this in this way rather than the sort of more traditional um core more traditional bars is because i want to kind of compare the shapes of the profiles of scaling um, of different systems. And that proved more difficult using bar charts than it did using these slightly strange graphs. These, uh, these graphs give you a sense of where the peaks and troughs are in terms of job size um, for the different systems. So on here we have um, the blue representing Archer, the, sorry, Hector Phase 2A, the red re representing Hector Phase 2B, Green Phase 3, and Archer in the purple. So they are supposed to allow you to compare by eye any changes um, across the systems. So the biggest change really you can see on here, I think, is going from Hector Phase 2A, which is the blue curve, to Hector Phase 2B, which is the red, red curve. And that was the shift from um, 4 cores per node to 24 cores per node. And since then, the profiles changed a little bit for overall overall job sizes, but um, not a huge not compared to that step there. So job sizes between those two systems increased increased probably about um, twofold. And the use at or the ten thousand cores has increased by a factor of ten. So these sorts of areas around here and um, the job. The, it's generally increased by a factor of 10 going from the early system to the later system. But there's been, sorry, from, from um, phase 2A to phase 2B from the 4 core to 24 core the new system. But there's not been a huge amount of change since then. So, trying to understand why and um, maybe which applications did go carry on scale, did change their scale, which ones didn't, um, why hasn't the scaling changed as much, or why haven't larger job sizes been used as much as what we tried to delve into next? So having a look at individual um, application areas. So the first one I'm going to look at is uh, periodic electronic structure codes. So these account for probably the biggest single fraction of usage of um, any uh, area on any code type on Archer. So the big players here on Archer anyway, excuse me, are VASP, Caster, and CP2K. Um, there's a small amount of use of one tech which is growing more and more on Archer as time goes on. Um, Quantum Espresso sort of sits around in the background and there's some use of CRISPR as well. It's been more heavily used on more recent systems as well. So VASP is consistently the uh, most used code on the system. Um, followed by CASTEP. And CASTEP sort of decreased a little bit since um, phase 2A, uh, while CP2K has increased its um, profile slightly, especially going from phase, sorry, from phase 2A to phase 2B. Um, so, looking at these two codes seems to be the ones that showed the most change in some way. I mean, there was a big change in VASP between, it seems to have dipped a lot on phase 2B. I'm not quite sure why that is, but we're, what we'd, I thought we'd investigate in a bit more detail what the difference here between um, CPTK and CASTEP was. So this is the code profile for um, the CASTEP job size distribution. Um, and what you can see is there's actually very little change um, in the job size, the job profile between any of the systems. So there's a slight move in large core counts going from phase 2A to phase 2B reflected um, probably the increase number of cores per node, um, but then there's not been much change. And even for the uh, large job size, it seems to have dropped a bit, uh, going from 
phase 2b to phase 3 and Archer. And for the very largest, they're probably about the same. So why, why could this be? So one thing to remember is that the Archer cores are much more powerful or give much more performance um, for codes like Castor than their equivalent cores on Hector, even Hector phase 3. So there's not much, really much drive. Um, you get more out of an Archer core. So there's not a huge amount of drive to scale. The limits to scalability, I don't think, are particularly inherent in the code. Um, I've done a bit of work on Castor here, so you know a little bit about it. So, but actually, it's probably more limited by the useful scientific problems you'd want to treat with such a code. A little thing scaling here, you know. I mean, there's only so much power as I'm in a 128 cubed um, 3D FFT, for example. Okay, so the code can probably scale if you want to bigger and bigger systems, maybe doing more complicated um, actual work in the code, but but there's not the drive from the science, I don't think, to scale the code a huge amount larger. So one thing you could say as well, should we be using different algorithms and things like that with more potential scaling with a finite system size, finite system size. But if it doesn't improve the time to solution and it doesn't improve the scientific output, there's not much driver, I don't think, for um, scientists to push development in that direction. So that's one possible explanation for um, the fact that the cast of job size just job sizes haven't increased very much and uh, going from across as systems have evolved in size. And um, looking at um, CPTK for the same source of graph, you can see there was a it shows slightly larger job sizes than cast F, but not very much really. Um, and the larger job sizes mean it's slightly easier to use more CPU hours for the same number of jobs, which is probably why the growth that CP2K has moved up, essentially the lead team the way most use codes on the system. But why are the job sizes slightly larger for CP2K? So one option is there's a bit of inertia. Cast steps are slightly older code. People have been maybe using a bit longer and more sort of used to just you know, they submit jobs of a certain size and don't think about uh, changing the size of their jobs. And so there's just a bit of inertia. People keep kind of submitting the stuff for the same size, right? My supervisor gave me this job submission script. I'm going to carry on using it without editing it because I know it works. There might be slightly different problem spaces for the two codes. Maybe CP2, the cell science use, the people study generally using CP2K has a bit more potential for scale, for um, scaling. I don't know, maybe there's more larger systems, more amorphous systems rather than um, small crystalline systems, that sort of uh, thing. So it may be the case that for a particular scientific problem, CPTK just scales a little bit better because it has slightly different um, algorithms and set up. But what we actually need to do is go and talk to uh, the communities a bit more and find out what people are actually doing with CASTEP and CPTK that might explain um, these differences between the codes. Okay, so now I'm going, I mentioned that somebody asked a question about, I think it was Cliff asked a question about um, DL Poly. I'm going to go and talk a bit more about the embody codes. Um, including DL Poly. There's a significant difference in number of unique users for CASTEP versus CP2K. Um, I would have to actually go and physically look at the data. I don't have that on the top of my head. So this isn't my usage, uh, parties. So Phil, I can get back in touch with you. Um, and share that information. It's available in the stats that are available for download on the website as well because the, it has the um, text output files from the analysis tool. But I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. I don't think there's a huge difference, is my sort of feeling, but I could be just misremembering. Pardis is asking, do you use these two codes for crystallographic studies? So this analysis I'm showing is not for um, jobs that I've run. So these are jobs run by all Archer and Hector users. So they might cover, they'll probably cover a wide range of different science. Yes, and there's always um, re education in either direction. Um, so without going and speaking to the particular users who are using the particular codes, we don't have um, a knowledge of what exact science, what exact systems they're studying. All we have are the per statistics of what jobs they run. There are some things we can infer from um, 
what we're what we're looking at, and I'll show you that with the Folly, which shows something interesting now. So the embodied codes here, um, these are essentially molecular dynamics codes in, on Archer um, of various types. Uh, we can see um, the growth of biomolecular biomolecular simulation, sorry, and Gromax in particular in this chart here. You can see the Gromax usage has gone up hugely from um, the start of data collection. Um, lamp use is growing not generally for biomolecular simulation, but in terms of when we see on Archer, it's often for um, materials, more material science type applications, and so is DL Poly. It's generally material science rather than biomolecular simulation. And um, people are using lamps for more meter scale type simulations, multi scale simulations, and things like that as well. So the DL Poly profile is interesting because it's pretty steady, maybe even decreasing a bit, apart from a huge peak on Hector phase three. So, and this actually, when we look at the data in more detail, shows some um, actual interesting points. So this is the plot of usage of DL poly job size on different systems. So you can see on Hector phase 2A, the job size peak was some like 380 to 1500 cores. On Archer, it's very, the job sizes are generally quite small. But then on Hector phase 2B, two, two and then on phase 3, there was a big change. The peak is right up at the um, 12,000 to 24,000, and then the 24,000 to essentially 120,000 cores for, Hector, for the last, late, latter stages of Hector. And I think what this shows for the embody code, um, like DL poly, embody codes like DL poly, is that the scaling is purely dependent on the problem being treated. It's nothing to do with the code. This large peak um, for these large jobs running are on um, the Hector system were due to a particular project that was studying huge systems and so could scale out to huge numbers of cores. And then that project's finished and is no longer on Archer and DL poly usage has reverted back down to a small size. So the scaling of DL poly isn't limited by the code at all. It's limited purely um, by the um, system that people, systems that people are studying. And if we go on to this, you can sort of see this if you go on to look at the embody codes for um, biomolecular simulations. So this is the Gromax size distribution here. Right, and you can see um, Gromax was hardly used on hectophase 2A, so we can sort of ignore um, that code because it's not really represented. But there's not been much change in job size um, going from hectophase 2A, uh, sorry, hectophase 2B, hectophase 3 to Archer. The reason for that is because, because these codes, the scaling is limited by the um, problem size they're treating, really. And in biomolecular simula simulation, um, you tend to have a very well-defined job size, uh, sorry, a well-defined uh, system size, because it's the size of the um, protein molecule you're treating, or the membrane you're looking at, or the DNA strand you're investigating. There is a finite size to what I'm getting at. There is a particular size, and there's no more scaling to be had from these codes. I mean, there's a huge amount of work that's gone into improving the scaling of Gromax. It's a well-developed code. It can use MPI plus OpenMP. It's very efficient, but it has the potential for very good scaling. But it's the system size that's limiting the scaling I'm getting at here, not the code itself. Okay, so moving on to um, the grid-based code, these are the climate and ocean codes that make up a large fraction of usage on Archer. So we've got things like um, the Met Office Unified Model, which is UM here, and WRF is another uh, forecasting climate simulation model, same as MIT GCM. NEMO is a um, ocean modeling code, and OASIS is essentially a coupling code. It couples together a um, model of the climate with a model of the ocean. And in on Archer, it's generally used to couple a unified model to NEMO. Um, so you can do a unified simulation. Um, these codes tend to be, although they're grid-based, tend to be 
generally use structured or unstructured grids. In the, in the UK here, in, in our case, most of them are structured grids uh, used for climate modeling in particular. Uh, the Met Office are using just as much time, I think, as they have been throughout, sorry, the uh, Met Office UN is using just as much time as it has been throughout all the systems. But the proportion of its usage has decreased just because um, other codes have up the amount of time they're using. The really the only story on move the only ch big change here apart from the UM drop the fraction of the UM drop is um, the Oasis couple usage on Arch which has just um, jumped up in a huge way. So here's a look at the uh, Met Office UM job size distribution. This is a series of slightly different profiles of the so some material science bio simulation codes we've been looking at so far. You can see that. Um, Aaron's asking, well, is that one project drive, driving or several? I think it's actually just one project. Um, but they're quite a big project, and actually it's NCAS, which is the National Centre for Atmospheric Science. So these are a sort of slightly different profile to the codes I've been looking at so far. Here you can see that actually has been generally some sort of increase in size going from the uh, early hectare systems a sort of significant increase in size from the early hectosystems systems through to the later hectosystems systems than then Archer. Okay, there's um, probably been maybe a doubling moving from Hector, the first Hector to Archer in terms of job size generally, some sort of something around that. So the reason for this is there's a scientific drive here to higher resolution grids with more potential parallelism and more potential for scaling. So in this case, rather than being limited by the science, the scaling of these codes is more limited um, by the code design. Okay, so one of the problems with the Met Office UN, particularly older versions of it that run on Archer for climate simulations, is that the I.O. strategy that they've chosen can limit the scale in particular. It's all it's about how much data you can get out to disk rather than um, how well the code itself scales. Um, and but coupling together um, the ocean models and the atmospheric models, both of which have potential for scaling, gives you a chance to run at very huge, at huge numbers, of course, right? Because you have potential to uh, scale out very well. So, oh, sorry, I have, the, I have the data here for the Oasis couple. But when we looked at the Oasis job sizes, um, they're very, very large because essentially you just multiply, you just add together the scaling you've got for your ocean code and the scaling you've got for the atmospheric and you use that many cores for your. Um, total air system model. So there's a potential to scale those for many of these simulations. And actually, in these cases, the thing that's holding back the scaling is generally the code design and code development and the algorithms in the code rather than the um, science itself. Similarly, for the uh, CFD codes, which are also grid-based, tend to be you tend to find a lot more unstructured grids in the CFD codes. Um, they also have the potential to scale in the same way. So the story here also is slightly different from all the other ones where we've seen um, in uh, for 24,000 no jobs for the UM is production use or test, most likely a scaling test, I think. Um, if you ever see any production runs for the unified model, you tend to have a high use, high um, proportion of the usage. If you have high production runs at scale, they will be able to use up um, resources so quickly that they very quickly impact on the um, scaling plots and would produce a much flatter profile than you see here. Because it's very easy to use a, lot, a large amount of time once you're using the largest job sizes. So for the CFD codes, it's slightly different from the codes from the other classes we've seen before, where the actual codes in use have been quite stable over the lifetime of services. Here you see that a different code seems to dom dominate on each of the services. So for example, on phase 2A, it was the Hydra code. On phase 2B, it was something called Incompact 3D. On phase 3, there was much more of a mishmash of codes. And then on Archer. Um, the hip star code accounts for a huge amount of usage. So 
what this seems to indicate is that the codes here are much more linked to particular research outcomes, particular research projects, rather than having general purpose codes that are used for science. You develop a code for a particular um, use, and then its use tends to die away as that sort of phase of science is complete. There are a couple of codes in here that are much more general purpose. I think Hydra, for example, is a general purpose code that's been used across all systems uh, quite a lot. Um, open phone as well as much more general purpose, but it has its own scaling issues that we are not going to talk about in this talk. But the codes tend to have shorter lifetimes than, say, in material science, biomedical simulation, climate science um, in the CFD space. So for ex and one example I have here is the HIPSTAR job size distribution. So you can see on um, it didn't wasn't actually used at all on phase two A. On phase two B there were small jobs. On phase three and Archer there have been much larger jobs. What this shows I think here is there was the code was developed and tested while Hector phase two B was around and then put into production at large job sizes on phase three and Archer. That seems to fit the profile of the site we're um, seeing here. And as for the climate simulation and the other grid-based codes, there's, all, there's a drive to um, higher resolution grids as time goes on, which increases the potential for scaling. There's also a drive to more complex geometries, dynamic elements, things like um, moving rotors. Um, these make it difficult to win jobs, more difficult to win jobs at scale because of load balancing issues and things like that, and changing communication patterns. But the potential there is to scale. And the scaling, again, is not limited by the scientific problem being treated. It's limited more by the code development, in this case, again, in these grid-based codes. So I'm almost at the end here. So just a bit of future luck before I do the summary. So I think, and again, I have to emphasize this is really broad brush, high-level analysis, and there are going to be um, exceptions uh, to the number of cases. So there seems to be two types of code broadly that rule on national services. There are those where the, sky, the scaling of the code is generally limited by the scientific problem rather than the code itself. For example, biomolecular simulation. There's only a finite number of atoms in a biopolymer, even if you're running a very large um, biopolymer simulation. Um, so how can they get the most out of future systems where we're going to have higher core counts, more power per node, maybe balance between power per node to uh, communications and memory has changed somewhat. So what they should be able to do quite easily is use the additional throughput that's available to access more for sophisticated sampling techniques. Right? So a lot of the case, in particular biomolecular and even in uh, material science now, you're trying to sample a large amount of space, a large amount of parameter space and things like that. And the additional throughput available on larger systems will help you do more sophisticated statistical analysis. So you can use this in, uh, within the application itself, or there's code, code agnostic frameworks, things like PUNED, that allow you to um, do metadynamics um, and different more complex statistical simulations, looking for rare events, those sort of things. So they'll still be able to use the codes. Maybe the individual instances of their jobs won't scale, but the actual total um, job size and throughput they need to be able to produce the science they want to do will be enabled by the larger systems. And there's a second type of code where the scaling is really not limited by the scientific problem, or and not the moment anyway. Right? There's a caveat for that, but at some point that will become true as well for them. Um, so these are the grid-based methods. And um, there's the opportunities here for the single calculators to scale out to very large core counts. Of course, they can exploit the additional throughput in the same way um, that and the other type of codes can, but they're limited around code development. Well, actually, in both cases here, it's the continued software development key to important future HPC architectures, right? The um, hardware will be updated as time goes on, but developing the software and strategies to couple the software in novel ways or um, use the software in novel ways for different sampling techniques is what's going to be key to exploiting. The hardware, in my opinion, anyway, and of course I would sort of say that because I'm an application person, an application person. So um, that's true. Uh, so there's, there is that caveat there. So there's always a balance to be struck, I think, here between new research opportunities being opened up by co-development, leading to 
more scaling so you can treat more larger complex problems or additional functionality to address different research problems and provide a different view. Okay, and both of these, they're, they're not mutually exclusive, um, but I don't think we need to think about the, I think it's not so helpful to think about the scaling, the monolithic scaling of sing, single code anymore. The landscape is much more complicated than that. So different research areas have different needs. So, and these sort of advanced sampling frameworks, things like that have less coverage and visibility to, in terms of certainly in terms of national HPC and code development. And maybe we should be refocusing and working with those codes as well as the traditional monolithic codes as well. So that's my sort of brief future look. And so just in summary, um, what we see from our data is that most applications are able to increase their scaling and switch from cod core to sort of multi-core. Um, but the core count jumped six times and most codes jumped the uh, job size by two times rather than six times. It seems that some areas scaling is limited by research problems and application issues. Um, I think the DL Poly use sort of illustrates that quite, the DL Poly use and the Gromax and body codes illustrate that really quite nicely. Um, there are some problems, sorry, the application scaling limits may never be reached for these codes for problems that are scientifically relevant. Right? You might just have code that you can just keep scaling, but you have no desire to treat. And there's no, nothing useful you could do you know, scientifically or in the research when using those codes. For another area, the application scaling is key to further research. And obviously, examples of climate research where you want a higher and higher bridge resolution. Um, and so on. So, future HPC systems are quite likely to offer opportunities to track these both classes, right? So, in the UK, I think we need to be maybe a bit less focused on single application scaling and look at sampling, coupling frameworks, these more complicated. Look at the scientific workflow a bit more holistically. That's a horrible word to use in any talk, but looking at um, scientific workflows that way. We need to understand those things a bit more, I think, rather than the individual applications. And there's a huge, I mean, I've got lots of, there's, there's lots of this data available, and you can look at it in very detailed level or very high level, and there's lots more analysis and exploration for this data to be done, I think, and carrying on looking at it um, in tandem with the research communities is where I want to go next with this thing. So that's me done. And I'm sorry it was a sort of semi rambling way and it took a little bit of time to get set up at the start. But if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to ask them. Probably um, via the chat is the easiest way to do it in the first instance. So Erin's asking, getting hands on the pipe analysis code. That's no problem whatsoever. It's actually um, open source in a GitHub repository, so I can just share the link. I can share the link to that, and you can download it. You will have, of course, I will have that um, code embarrassment of people looking at my scripts. But as long as you can not cringe too much, then that'll be fine. So for, yes, Alps is runnable by using Archer. So there's a series of commands that begin with AP that you can run. Probably the most useful is AP stat. Um, I can type that in the tempo. So, so AP stat is the most useful command. Um, and that shows you a list of all currently running applications. So I can see there's a couple of people typing, so I'll just wait for those to appear. While I'm doing that, I can try and um, I can try and get up to show you where the um, data is downloaded. 
If you want to have a look at the data yourself, so if you go to the and can everybody can people see the um, Archer website in the window there? I'm trying to make it appear for everybody. Cool. So, um, so Phil's also asked, and um, what do you think the best way to educate users is, users is for efficient panel usage? So. This is quite difficult because having it's quite difficult for for the uh, service in some ways because there are so many users. It's really difficult for us to get a link into all of them, and there's so much, in some sense, folk knowledge passed down within research groups about how your thing scales and how it does. Most people don't undertake any sort of benchmarking when they first get onto the system. They just take the JavaScript they were given and run with that and run with that for the lifetime um, of their code. I, we can try and do webinars such as these, and but you only get people who actually attend or view them afterwards, view the recordings afterwards. One thing I always thought we should do um, is publish some sort of benchmark data for the major codes on the website. So for example, we have a page for Castor, we should publish um, scaling graphs for Castor and make it clear what systems they are for, so people can maybe have a look at them and say, oh, well, my systems that sort of around that sort of size, so I could start there with my scaling test. But getting people into the habit and trying to get people into the habit of benchmarking, even if it's quick benchmarking, whenever they get onto a new system. Well, exactly. I mean, it is so usage dependent, so case dependent, as Aaron says, is that. But again, if you could get users into the habit whenever they get into a new system, the first thing they do is run a quick set of benchmarking benchmarks for the problem they're treating um, to optimize their usage of the system. That's the way to go. We can get people doing that. I think. Sorry, I was going to say also show you where the statistics were. So on the Archer website, if you go to the documentation tab and write down. Um, near the bottom is the Archer white papers link. I'm going to try to click on that. Oh, yeah, there we go. So there's a number of white papers here, and one of them is the paper associated with this talk. So I, there is actually a paper from the conference that goes into a bit more detail um, on the statistics than I talked about in the actual talk, and that's available there. And the supplementary data there contains all the um, core counts and raw statistics I used. Yeah, okay. So I'd be interested in seeing that, Aaron, because that'd be something we'd be interested in providing on Archie. The easier you can make it for people um, to do these things, then the more chance you have of getting them to do it, obviously. <laughs> Yours will be better. Okay, does anybody else have any more questions before we wrap up? I see Cliff's typing, so I'll sweep for that before we finish. Okay, so in terms of parallel um, model used for coding, that is include, included in the analysis. I haven't included it here, but if you look in the white paper, we talk about which codes use MPI and things like that, and what percentage use of MPI compared to other parallel models is. And we even look at um, percentage use of Fortran compared to C++ and C and things like that in the paper. These are all the sort of metadata we've attached to each of the codes. Um, actually monitoring who uses which routines of MPI is more difficult. We need to be able to look at 
Well, the two ways of doing it, you could try and monitor it in flight, which has the potential to affect uh, performance, which is difficult, which you wouldn't want to do. You could do some code analysis and look at the source code of the major codes and find out which routines occur. And the other way we could do it, and I was talking with the um, Dirac benchmarking team about this this morning, I think, is that you could profile um, the code, some of your major codes running benchmarks on the system and make those profiles available. And they would show the percentage of time spent in different MPI routines, for example, among other statistics like memory usage, cache usage, percentage of peak floating point. Um, so another action would be to get that data for major codes from representative calculations. Yeah, so you can profile not trace, yeah. I think doing it for the whole for that. I mean, I'd be interested if there was a framework that worked on the Cray that could do that. I think could be interesting statistics. Um, so I might go and ask Cray and see if they know of anybody who's been doing anything like that on the Cray systems. So that is a good idea. I mean, yeah, it would be interesting to see what's going on. Okay, if there's no more questions from anyone, then thank you all for attending and listening to me waffle on for a while. That's something that I found interesting, and I hope you found it at least partially interesting too. Um, this uh, talk will be up as a recording on the Archer website um, for you to look at or to share with your friends and things like that. So probably in the next day or so, hopefully. Thank you, everybody.